So good morning uh, or good afternoon or good evening wherever whenever you watch this video we'll talk today about the second and the profane as you know we switch from the first book to the second book and now we no longer talk about specific religions but we talk about two different attitudes and both of them can be found in all religions that we have discussed so far and at the same time in all the religions that we may not have discussed so do uh, you have this picture on the powerpoint with an old lady and a cow and you may see different things in the picture. Some of you may see an old woman who is perhaps poor and uh, she uh, alone perhaps and she is with an animal, some, an animal close to her. Some other people may see the fact that she is ready to eat the cow. Or what, uh, there are different ways in which you can perceive perhaps this picture. But one of the ways in which you can perceive it is the fact that this woman is manifesting joy and thanksgiving and thanksgiving because she depends on the cow in the sense in which she is not an individual separated from the cow but is rather together with but rather together with the cow it form she forms a bond she lives because of the cow she has milk from the cow she may have meat later if she eats the cow completely but in any case she forms a bond why am i introducing this mainly because if you consider the picture, if you consider the woman as being separated from the cow, at that moment the woman perceives the cow only as an object. An object that she, that she can use. There is no communion between the cow and the woman in that sense. However, if you consider the woman as being in communion with the cow, or rather having a thanksgiving for the relationship they have, and I do acknowledge the fact that it may sound odd to talk about the relationship between a cow and a human being. Although many have relationships with cats and dogs and whatever else you may think of. But in that case, it's not about the relationship between someone who looks at an object and uses the object, but rather between someone who looks at the world around her and gives thanks for that world. Okay, so we talked about, uh, we talked about the old lady and the cow and how she has a certain relationship with the cow and it's about thanksgiving and it's not about separation and if you consider those two ideas thanksgiving on the one hand and separation on the other hand you can see the distinction that Mircea Eliade has between homo religiosus and homo religiosus. This, this distinction is not what you may consider the distinction between an atheist and a religious human being, or an atheist and a faithful human being, let me put it this way. Because from Eliade's perspective, it could be that a religious human being, or forgive me, what we call a faithful human being, may have an a-religiosus, a well, that's incorrect actually if I put it this way, it may have an attitude similar to a homo a religiosus, someone who doesn't have the same approach as a homo religiosus has. In what sense? Perhaps Consider, for example, the way people go to church. You may go, some people may go to church just because it's the thing to do on Sunday. Some other people may go to church just because they feel a certain connection with it or because they consider that going to church, they form indeed the body of Christ as it is supposed to be in the forming of the liturgy. The liturgy being the Mass on Sunday if you are a Catholic or uh, the Sunday service if you would be a Protestant and uh, so on. So, uh, Probably the most important difference between the homo religiosus and the homo a religiosus is that one of them sees the presence of God at all moments in everything. The homo a religiosus does not see the presence of God, but rather expects for a world after this one in which God might be present, but here we do whatever we need to do in the absence of God. So let me say it again, the homo religiosus considers God's presence in everything. Homo religiosus lives every day as if God was not present. Let me show you another picture. You see this picture and you may, can see, uh, you may look again and uh, obviously you see a beautiful mountain, a beautiful, how do you call that in English? Madonna mia, my students will tell me now because you're over there. Uh, Paysage. Uh, 
And did you look at a panoramic? Panoramic, yeah. You could say that, panoramic? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you may see a bit of the panoramic, but if I look at this picture, I of course see the same things that you see, but at the same time, it reminds me of something because it is very close to the place where I was born, and it's very close to the place where I lived. In that sense, I, I see something beyond that picture. Homo religiosus sees something beyond the church. The Homo religiosus, when he or she goes to the church, he doesn't, she doesn't go to a building, but she goes because there she feels, or he feels, the presence of God. You can see that, for example, when you uh, ima remember your grandparents, the house of your grandparents. You may live with them or you may not live the, with them now. They may still be alive or they may not be alive right now. But if you go back to the house in which they live, that house reminds you of things. Reminds you of things that are not present at that moment physically. Reminds you of things that are beyond the physical thing that you see. It will not remind me of anything. And in that sense, because it does not remind me of anything, I would have perhaps the same attitude that a profane human being would have. I will only see an object, a house. For you, it will be more than a house. I am not saying that you are a homo religiosus, and I am not, because the moment we talk about the homo religiosus and the homo non religiosus, we have it in connection with the divine. I'm just giving you this example of the house of the grandparent to have a similarity between two different attitudes. So, in the same sense here, I look at the picture, it's not because it's not, I see my childhood, or I, it connects with me intimately, not because I am a homo religiosus and you're not, but rather because I have a certain connection with it. It's not only an object at which I look, but it is some kind of connection, and I form a communion with a place that you do not have, not because you are different within yourself, but rather because you do not have the experience with it. So let me continue. In, in the first part of the book, then the other talks about space and how space is connected with this difference between the sacred and the profane. For in the, uh, in the profane attitude, space is always the same. And just consider when you move from one town to another. I do not know about you, but I always hear people who go to a new town or to a new city, and the first question they ask is, where is Walmart? And they ask where is Walmart, mainly because probably they need things for their house or for their place where they move, but also because it is familiar. And if you go to Walmart in Peoria or in Lafayette, in Indiana, or if you go to on the East Coast or on the West Coast, West Coast, the Walmart looks the same. There is no difference. There is no break in space. If you look at the majority of the American cities, they look the same somehow. You have the downtown and you have all the stores spread around outside the city itself. In that sense, the space is homogeneous, always the same being. There is nothing that breaks the space. You do not have any kind of connection with a space that separates it somehow uh, from everything that is the same around you. However, that is because we ourselves as human beings become more and more profane and we never see anything other than the physical thing that doesn't have any form for us. For the sake, in the sacred attitude, the space has a connection with something else. There is always a break in the space that um, separates the identity of every little place in which we are, and it separates it in connection with something beyond the place itself. If you remember the picture before, for me, this is a break in the space not because it looks different than the mountains here, but rather because it is separated for me in my own soul, in my connection I have with it. If I go to the church, for example, the church is a break in the space because it connects me with the world beyond me. It connects me with infinity, or it, it connects me with the divine. And in the traditional societies, you can see, uh, you have this picture here, you see, uh, it's a little, I don't know if you see in the picture or not, but there is a certain light that comes on the stone. So, um, before I show you a few 
a few different pictures within traditional societies to see how a certain space connects an individual with something that is beyond this world, let me remind you of the fact that in the sac sacred attitudes, you always talk about presence and thanksgiving. You are always present in the world, one with the world. The world is given to you, not to use it, but rather to have, to have communion with it. So you're not a subject that looks at the world and uses it the way you please and you consume it. But rather, you are part of it and in that sense, you are also responsible for it. You are responsible for it, not as an owner, but rather as a shepherd. And we'll talk later about, the sh about what it is to be a shepherd. And um, here are a few examples of how the sacred is separated. If you look at uh, within traditional churches, Wherever the place of the altar, I hope you see in the pictures, the place of the altar is always separated also visually. You can see here, for example, can you see the red line? You can see here that the altar is a little bit on a higher step. The same here. Mm -hmm. That is mainly how it is within a church. But also, if you think about, uh, I forgot to change this, but anyway, if you think about, uh, if you think about how a traditional village is constituted, the church is always placed in the middle, and all around the church you see the house is built. Why? Because being itself is taken from my, commu my, my communication with the divine. I am not real unless I am in communication or in uh, communion, if I were to put it this way, with the divine. In that sense, all the other buildings around the church are formed from the space that brings my communion with the divine, that brings my connection with the divine. Uh, in this one, for example, you can see here the church and then all, uh, all around it, houses will be built. You may see here better, you have the church in the middle, and then all around the town is constructed. The same here. And now in traditional families, for example, especially in some cultures, and I give you many examples from uh, my own tradition, just as you will give in your papers examples from your own traditions. Here, for example, in houses, you have a certain icon co uh, corner, people are called. Why? Because at that moment, you break the space of the house. You see the icons over there, all of them, and people go pass by and make the sign of the cross, for example, if you are not those Christian in that way, or make the sign of the cross differently if you are Catholic, or do not make any sign of the cross if you are a different tradition in Christianity. But in any case, you have a break within the space. All of a sudden, the house is no longer homogenous. Obviously, you can talk about the fact that you have the bedroom, you have the living room, you have all the other things, but they are all, in some respect, the same. In the religious attitude, you break the space. And before I end with this part, at least, let me give you an example how we can still do that, even if we are not religious. Let's consider how some people in the living room put certain objects that would define them. Very nice books, or if you're a hunter, you put the, uh, what do you call those? Something from a deer, you know, the, the head of a deer, or you put a bear, or whatever you put, in order to communicate something about you to the people who come. In that sense, you have a break in the space. But the break in the space, all of a sudden, does not refer to anything that goes beyond you, but it refers to you. And that's the main difference, or one of the main ideas that can, uh, can help you see the difference between the homo religiosus and homo non religiosus or ar religiosus. The homo religiosus always is a connection with something beyond him and is thirsty of the being that he would have or she would have from the connection they have with that which is beyond. The homo non religiosus always is him or her as the center and as the source of his own or her own good. Okay, so a last few words. Remember, we talked about the difference between subject and object, and you had that in the previous, uh, in the previous chapters that you read in different, about different religions. The moment I consider myself, uh, the moment I have an objectified relationship with the world around me, I am using the world for my own benefit. If I look at the world as the space in which I belong, that is, I am not different from the world, but I am rather there as being responsible for it, being together with it, then I have a different relationship with the world. 
uh, let me try to explain that by giving an example. What happens when someone gives something, gives an up, gives a gift, for example? In the profane attitude, I give an object. I give an apple, and that's all I give. In the sacred attitude, because I am one with the world, it is me that I give. It's no longer an object of the world, but it is my own, myself, that I give to the other. So in giving the apple, as you see in the, with this old, uh, old lady, it's not a giving on an object I have. And in that sense, you are going to owe me for that object. But it's rather in giving myself to you by giving myself to the world. And I'm going to just read you a quote here from Father Arsenio Boca. When you give at the beginning, you give from what you have. After a while, he says, you give from what you are, because you become one of the world. One final slide. In the religious attitude, the world itself becomes our being. When you read about Christianity, you read perhaps about Bethlehem, the, pra the place in which Christ was born. In um, Hebrew, Bethlehem, it comes from two words, Bait, Lehem. And those are, the, it mean, the, uh, together mean the house of the bread. And it's not a wonder, the fact that, it's no wonder that Christ was born in Bethlehem, in the house of the bread, because in Christianity, Christ becomes our being by becoming bread. Thank you.